everybody and welcome to this interview that I'll be conducting with Michael Swain from Freedom of Religion South Africa. If you remember at the end of 2019, there was this massive campaign against comprehensive, comprehensive sexuality education that the government was trying to push onto the schools right at the last minute in November, just before the December school holidays. We uh, managed to grow a Facebook group of over 130,000 people and we opposed CSE in our schools at every chance we had, culminating in action we took on the 13th of February during the State of the Nation address all across South Africa. Parents came together and gave uh, the same statement, declaring that we have parental rights over our children and government should not interfere in that. And what happened as a result of that is that the Minister of Basic Education said that the comprehensive sexuality education is no longer compulsory. And the government has not rested since that moment. We got very uh, caught up in the pandemic that happened, of course, the, the entire country and the group, of course. Uh, parents had a lot of other things to worry about, such as livelihood. People were losing jobs. People had to uh, school their kids at home because kids weren't allowed at school. And life got really, really crazy. And the government, of course, does not sleep. And they have created something that we're going to be discussing tonight that is very, very interesting. It's extremely important that you take note of what is happening in your children's uh, schools. And we're going to discuss what the government has implemented in, and in effect, what they've done is completely circumnavigated any public participation progress uh, process and have completely avoided consultation with parents. And so today I'm introducing to you Michael Swain from 4SA. Hi, Michael. Uh, will you please briefly describe what the ECE toolkit actually is? Yes, thanks, Lauren. It's great to be with you. The, the ECE toolkit is a teacher training program that was developed by the Department of Basic Education, thanks to, as is often the case, a 40 million rand grant from a Belgian-based organization called VVOB, and in uh, consultation and in cooperation with the University of Selimbosch. Now, you would think that a teacher training program sounds fairly innocuous, but this is not training teachers in some new blackboard technique or some technology. This is teaching teachers to basically create a culture of transgender ideology within the classroom. And we're talking here specifically the classrooms of pre-primary and primary school age children. That's children between zero to nine years of age. In other words, little children who have absolutely no way of processing this type of information. So that's what the ECE toolkit is. That's what it's doing. I should tell you that they piloted it in 2019, which was about the same time as there was this big fight against comprehensive sex sexuality education being mainlined into schools. And thereafter, they have rolled it out in, we know, at least five provinces. So this is not only uh, done, it's it's happening, and it may even be wider and more prevalent than we uh, think at the moment. We're going to go into exactly what will be taught to teachers in a minute, but Michael, I'd love for you to just introduce who you are to the audience and just highlight how you got to know about the ECE toolkit and your involvement since 2019 up until this point. Well, I had an organization called Freedom of Religion South Africa, 4SA. And we are a legal advocacy uh, organization. We specifically uh, uphold the constitutional rights that we've been given to freedom of religion, which is in section 15. But that is far broader than just your right to believe whatever faith it is that you choose. It's, it's freedom of thought, conscience, belief, opinion. It's your views. It's your right to associate, to assemble. And particularly in this case, it's obviously your right as a parent to pass on your views and your values to your own children without interference and certainly without contradiction from the state. So th th that's what we uh, have been doing. And we came across this uh, as a result of one of our meetings with the Department of Basic Education, because we are, in a sense, watchdogs. We watch what's going on, what's coming out of parliament, what's going on in government departments. And when we heard about this, we immediately addressed it. And we informed and have been working with the senior leadership of uh, multiple faith groups uh, we have helped put together what is just now known as a coalition 
which is the senior leadership of all the Islamic uh, faith communities. It's called the UKSA, United Ulama Council of South Africa. That represents about nearly 2 million people of the Islamic faith. Uh, with uh, the Evangelical Alliance of South Africa, TISA, they represent about 4 million people uh, from denominations, some of which you would have heard of, like the AFM and the AOG, Assembly of God. Uh, also, an organization called SACOV, which has multiple networks of independent churches under it, also numbering about probably four to five million. And then uh, the African traditional spirituality uh, churches and structures, and they represent uh, somewhere close to 10 million. So in total, we're talking about a coalition representing 20 million people from diverse faith communities. And we met with the Department of Basic Education on this specific topic uh, in December last year. And essentially, we, uh, when we met with them, uh, 4SA's role was primarily to actually expound on the legal position of parents, which we can get to in a minute. But effectively, the message to the DB was, this is indoctrination. You have no right to indoctrinate children, and least of all with a single ideology of transgenderism, which is only going to be deeply confusing to them. And secondly, uh, to remind them, of course, that the white paper on education, which is their own policy, says that parents have the inalienable right, i.e. a right that's not given, it's simply recognized, both in South African law, international law, to educate your own children and to pass on your views and values, particularly in the area when children are younger and for to be consulted by the state. And also, of course, to demand that they stop doing this, because, as I said, this has been going on now for probably about five years already. And the last thing we asked them for was to uh, establish a family values unit within the Department of Basic Education, because what they've done is they set up something called a social cohesion and equity in education unit, uh, which is obviously uh, being very much fueled and fostering uh, this particular ideology. And we said that we need a family values unit so that all views can be developed. So that was basically how it came out. It was uh, a meeting that we put together a 35 page comprehensive position paper, uh, setting out the law, setting out the viewpoints. And that was presented to them in December last year. Can't wait to discuss that uh, response, uh, which we'll do at a, at a different time. Um, but yeah, you mentioned quite a lot of points there. You say that parents have inalienable rights uh, on one hand, and then you also say that, um, so together you have managed to bring together about 20 million people of different faiths, which is a lot. It's, it's a lot of people, especially when you think about voting capacity. And then uh, with the census that came out, uh, the census results that came out, says that I think it's over 80% of South Africans are Christians. And I think it's safe to say that the majority of South Africans, especially the voter base, are at least conservative in their values. And, and their values are centered around the, the traditional family unit. And I find it very interesting that the government is pushing something so contrary to that. And it makes me think of the donation or the sponsorship from the Belgium-based organization. What can you tell us about that Belgium-based organization? Well, they're essentially set up to bring what they call inclusive values into uh, education. And they're obviously very well financed. But here's the strange thing. You know, we, we talk a lot at the moment about sort of African solutions for African problems. And we talk a lot about decolonization. And yet here comes an international organization bringing in a views and values and an ideology which is actually completely foreign uh, to the vast majority of the people in South Africa, whether you come from a religious background or whether you just simply have traditional values because of the culture that you've grown up in and that you've inherited from generations. And yet here comes this thing which is now effectively being imposed upon everybody's children. And this is really quite extraordinary. And I say it's particularly extraordinary because it is so contrary to the views and values of the vast majority of South Africans. Uh, and, and, and secondly, of course, it is completely in conflict with the international and local laws that govern the very area that we're talking about. 
You know, you'd think if a government wants to stay in power, they would then do the will of the people. But what we're seeing here is quite the opposite, which paints a picture. And I love the word you use, colonization. It paints a picture of, in a sense, a global colonization of our policies. And that's trickling into our education system. So let's get into what exactly is in this ECE toolkit. What are the teachers, your children's teachers, going to be teaching your children? That's what I'd love to know. Well, you just have to read some quotes. And again, one doesn't want to exaggerate these things. And therefore, it's important that we actually read out exactly what it says. Because in, in all honesty, it, it, some of it's so extraordinary that it's hard to believe that it's true if it wasn't written. And you can look it up, by the way. Uh, there are links on the forsa.org.za website where you can actually click through and read this uh, ECE toolkit for yourself. But it says here, listen to this. Uh, most of us have been raised with the idea that there are two sexes, male and female, and that they align across two genders, man and woman. However, both sex and gender exist across a continuum of possibilities. Transgender is a term that includes the many ways people's gender identities can be different from the sex they were assigned at birth. It's all the terminology, of course. Uh, people who identify with transgender have a gender that's different from the gender associated with their sex. And it, it basically says that the purpose of this is to make sure that this understanding of sex and sexuality is effectively pushed into the pre-primary and primary school age groups. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to give you a couple, a couple more quotes. Um, let me just get some shorter ones because I've got long ones. And again, we can let everybody have this because this is not something that's hidden away in a dark place. You know, this is something that's there for all to read and see. Uh, the I just want the to, um, sorry, uh, I just want I... to interject there. Sorry, I just want to interject there and just highlight to the listeners that this is early childhood education. This is from the ages of 0 to 9. And this is your ECD centers, I'm sure, teachers from ECD centers. And um, grade R, remember the, the president's trying to make grade R compulsory and even pre-grade R compulsory as per one of his SONO addresses. And this means that as young as four or five, children will be indoctrinated to believe that their gender is separate to their sex at birth. Sorry for yeah, the no, interruption. I just want to bring home the fact that this is not teenagers. You can still argue a point. This is being taught to little children, tiny children. We all know that the formative years between the ages of naught and seven are the most important fundamental years. And the government has complete power over what they are putting into your children's minds. You can continue, Michael, with the quotes. I'd love to hear what else there is. No, 100 percent. Yeah, I mean, I think Aristotle is attributed with the quote which says, you know, give me a child until the age of seven and I'll show you the man. You know, when children are that age, they have no way of processing this type of information. Children just simply accept what they see. They believe what they hear. Uh, and uh, at this age, this is this age so where you actually, as a parent, putting the clothes on your child or at least giving them the clothes to wear. How on earth can they make decisions about their gender? But here we go. So this is what teachers must do. This is part of the training. They must, and I quote, ask learners from a young age for their preferred name and pronouns. So you may have named your child Johnny, Jenny, but the teacher's going to ask them, is that what you'd like to be called? Are, are you sure that you're a boy? Uh, what are your preferred pronouns? Would you like to be called something different from he and she, Johnny? They're actually putting this into the minds of these little children. Uh, teachers oh. are now in the classroom, and, and, and let me just push the point home, uh, they, they are going to use, they say they must use they, them pronouns, and the reason given is in this training to let children know that we cannot assume someone's gender just by looking at them. In other words, they're literally going to say to children, you cannot believe your own eyes. If you're looking at a little girl and your mummy and daddy may have told you that they're a little girl, uh, that that's what little girls look like, well, if your mummy and daddy, first of all, are telling you that there are only boys and girls, they're trying to harm you and hold you back in life. That's the uh, purpose of this training is to try and break those gender stereotypes. But secondly, they might not be. They might be a little boy. You just don't know. You can't believe your own eyes. How, how is that possibly in the best interest of children? You know, education, the paramount interest that you have to consider uh, when educating and even just constitutionally is what is in the best interest of children. Is it in the best interest of children to confuse them deeply? Is it in the best interest of children to literally divide them from their parents or to divide the teachers uh, from the parents? 
how can this possibly be in the best interest of children? But, but it gets one step uh, perhaps even more evident. And that is that, of course, and here is the logical extension, teachers must encourage children, and here I'm quoting, to use the toilet facilities that correspond with their gender identity. So this is straight up and down transgenderism. It's an ideology, it's an indoctrination. It's happening right now in pre-primary and primary school ages, little children are being taught this stuff. I'd just like to interrupt you there and just ask parents listening, how will you feel dropping your little girl uh, at grade R, for instance, or grade one, for instance, imagine it's her first day or first week in grade one, dropping off at school, a new environment, no friends yet, and now you have to leave knowing that little boys can go into the little girl's bathroom. How does that make you feel as a parent? And how much longer are we going to get let the government take control of our children in this way? It's absolutely shocking. And as I'm listening to you, Michael, I cannot believe that those that came up with this ECE toolkit have children themselves. Because if they did, they'll know that a child will throw a tantrum over the color spoon that they have to eat their breakfast with. Children can't make decisions. And they're not emotionally mature enough to weigh the information being presented to them. So they're just going to absorb it like a sponge. It's going to become their reality. And we will find that our children are complete aliens to us as they get older and we won't understand what happened. Meanwhile, it was the school curriculum. And now it's not being put into life orientation necessarily. The government is clever. The government has circumnavigated that. Never say that the government's stupid because it's not. They've found a way to get into the minds of our children through training the teachers first. Um, are there any other disturbing revelations you'd like to share? Well, if you're not disturbed enough already, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you know, the, the, and this is exactly as you said it. What they're doing is they're not saying we're going to deliberately teach this, but we are going to create a culture within which all education takes place that is based on a transgender ideology. And th that is 100% contrary to the law of this country, to the policies of the department itself. And I think the most important thing, Lauren, is what do parents now do? Because parents must, I believe, take the opportunity to speak up. This has now come to the light. And we actually challenged the Department of Basic Education to give us an email address so that concerned parents can write to them to express their views. And we said, positive or negative, listen, not everybody's against this, let's bear that in mind. Mm -hmm. But those parents who want to have their say, this is the moment to do it. Uh, if you go to the forsa.org.za website, that's like forsa, forsa.org.za, there's an immediate click through. You can either click through for more information, and as I say, you can actually see this toolkit itself with your own eyes if you want to, um, or you can go straight to the Dear South Africa platform, and there, in two minutes, you can make your view heard. Your email will go straight to the department. I can tell you this. I think we've hit something of a hot button issue here. And I'm so glad that we have, because already uh, approaching now 6,000 people in the last two, three days since we've been uh, releasing this information have already written to the department. And I believe that they need to have an overwhelming response from parents. That's all they're going to listen to, by the way. But their, their response to us, and again, we can go into it in more detail, was quite extraordinary. They basically just said no to everything. And they even said at the end of it that they will. And they, in writing, put in capital letters like a shout, will be continuing this. So unless parents speak up now, this is the reality that we're going to live with. And let me tell you, this is going to literally warp, potentially, an entire generation. Once this mindset gets into little people, you can't get it out. It's the formative years. It's a complete attack and breakdown of humanity at the most fundamental level, which is the family unit. And it's, it's shocking that this is happening, that this is the time that we're living in right now. Uh, we've seen horror stories from overseas, especially many of the followers on Loco who have shared uh, overseas stories on such cases where um, transgender ideology has gone too far. Uh, but I would just like to bringing it back to the parents. And before we talk about the kind of actions they can take, I know there will probably be quite a few that will say, ah, but teachers will never actually implement this. Teachers know better. Teachers will just, you know, uh, leave it behind and they still have, you know, say over what takes place in the classroom. What have you got to say to that? Well, 
I would say that that's an absolute gamble because the one thing the Department of Basic Education has made clear, because we challenged them on infringing the religious freedom rights of teachers, because they also have religious freedom rights. And as you say, many teachers might be very uncomfortable actually being put in a position. But their view is that they are employees of the state. And what the state has decided to do is what the teachers must do. And if they're not going to do it, I guess the uh, alternative would be that they will face some kind of a sanction. So there will, without doubt, be pressure on them to conform and to comply. So I would say if you sit and take the view, well, maybe it will, maybe it won't, you're actually gambling with the lives of children, your children, potentially. So obviously you have that choice to make, but I would not count on the fact that teachers are simply going to say, no, thanks, we don't want this and we're not going to do it. However, one thing that you can do, of course, as parents, and if you're sitting on school governing bodies, you should do, is you should be asking the questions, what are our teachers being taught if you're in, even if you're not in pre-primary schools? Because believe me, this is going to go everywhere. This is not just going to be pre-primary schools. This is going to be an ideology to infuse the entire education system of this nation. Go to your school governing bodies. Ask them to, to find out what are teachers being trained in? What are they teaching children? What are the materials that are being used? Because you as parents need to know, because if you're ignorant, this thing is going to come upon you like a tidal wave. And once it's in, as I say, you're not going to get it out. I absolutely agree with my experience with uh, comprehensive sexuality education. I had a few heart-to-heart -heart conversations with a couple of teachers. And their ultimate view was that at the end of the day, they have to eat and they have to feed their families. And they, if they have to be disciplined or fired, if that's a risk for um, teaching CSE, they're going to do it. They're rather going to listen to the government than risk losing their jobs. Because of the financial situation most people are in in this country, not many people have financial uh, security. Not many people can risk losing their jobs. And that's a sad reality. So I just want parents to make sure parents understand that even the teachers you admire the most, that you admire um, how they teach and how they have values or how they're conservative, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, uh, they need to look after their jobs. And it's up to us as parents to use our democratic rights to make sure that the government does not roll this out. So, Michael, please explain what are our options, uh, especially because you are an expert in the legal field. Explain to the parents uh, what are their options, what are their rights as parents, even within our parents flawed systems that we have here in South Africa. Well, the first thing to know is that parents, the law is 100% on your side. Uh, the Department of Basic Education's own white paper on education, that's their, that's their policy paper, says that parents, obviously or guardians too, have the primary responsibility for the education of their children, that's you parents, and have the right to be consulted by the state authorities with, with respect to the form that education should take and to take part in its governance. So that is your one guaranteed right. Secondly, you have the inalienable right to choose the form of education, which is best for your children, particularly, as it says here in black and white, in the early years of schooling. So that's critical. That means that especially the government recognizes that your right as parents to educate your children with your views and your values is of paramount importance in the early years. And this is precisely the area that they are encroaching upon. And you also have the right, and again, this is from the policy, to choose uh, not only um, the, the form, but also the language, the cultural and, res and, and religious basis of your child's education. And by the way, the law also very clearly says, and it was settled in a case that we for a say were involved with, called the Oh God case, where they tried to push religion right out of schools altogether, that you cannot impose an ideology into the state school system. You cannot. It's unlawful. And this is an ideology because, number one, it's a belief system. And number two, it's because there is no alternative being offered. This is not a sort of a diversity one among. This is straight up and down one single ideology that's being imposed by the government. So what can you do? Well, the best strategy, we think at the moment, is to raise your voices. Because the more people raise their voices, the louder the shout comes. If you know, two, three thousand people make a noise. That's not a noise. That's a quiet whisper. If a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, half a million people raise their voices, that is a shout. The only way that I think we're going to stop this is if enough parents wake up 
and decide that we do not want this to be taught to our children to infuse their small minds at the most impressionable age. And we will live, live with the societal con consequences of that literally for generations. Thank you for that. Uh, we will definitely be discussing all of these things more in depth and uh, look out for a link on Leave Our Kids Alone, where we will definitely, uh, Michael, uh, do a live stream where we can actually go into more depth with regards to everything. This is just an introduction. There's so much to discuss here. There's so much more to discuss with regards to the specifics that are going to be taught. I've read through some of the material. It is absolutely shocking. I homeschool my children and I just cannot imagine how I would feel if I had no option but to send them to school right now. I feel very sorry for parents. It's a very tough time to bring to raise children. It seems like the government is enemy number one, trying to absolutely destroy the future generation, to destroy humanity, to destroy everything that is good in this world. And we need to stand up and put a stop to it. I will help on the hashtag leave our kids alone group with a framework as to what action you can take. Everyone can start right now by clicking on the link in the description uh, and signing that Dear SA form. You can put your uh, commentary in there. It is recognized as legitimate public participation by the government. It's in fact the only online means of publicly uh, participating that the government re recognizes. So please go follow that link. Let's turn those 6,000 uh, signatures into 600,000 and counting. And then look out on hashtag leave our kids alone for more steps to take, more action to take to make sure that this ideology does not creep into our classrooms and into our children's minds. It's already happening on TV shows, on uh, YouTube for our children. It's already happening, um, you know, on the devices. So let's make sure it doesn't creep into the education system as well. Let's hold on to the rights we have as parents to raise our children. Our children is all that we have when uh, left on this earth when we leave this world and their children and their children and so on. And, you know, I see, I never planned on having kids actually, but I ended up having four. And I actually find it so beautiful that children are born within a family unit, a mother and a father. And what happens is that that mother and father with unique ideas, unique experiences, teach that to their children. And their children continue that and so on. And the fact that we have a diversity of beliefs between different families is what, that is what strengthens humanity. And to have this now infiltrated into schools and in our children's minds is an insult to our very existence. And I hope to see everyone up in arms about this. Please don't be silent. We'll use, be using very much the same tactics as we did with uh, the comprehensive sexuality education. And I look forward to working with all parents and I'll also be putting 4SA's website link in this description. So please go have a look and read up some more. Be horrified and then let that horror drive you to action. Action is what is going to be required in order to get this out of schools. Thank you so much, Michael, for uh, taking the time to talk to us. It's been very important. You've been at the forefront. You've been hearing it from the horse's mouth. And just like with the CSE campaign, you are reading from material that comes from the Department of Basic Education. This isn't uh, fake news or things that are just spreading as years say online. This is documents you're reading from that come from the actual government. And we'll be going into a lot of detail with our next uh, interview here, where we'll actually discuss the government's response to uh, some of the objections that 4SA had on this ideology. Are there any final thoughts or last words that you have, Michael? Lauren, just a, a big word of thanks to you. Uh, thank you for being a champion. Thank you for standing up. Thank you to every parent listening to this who is right now clicking uh, on the link to actually have your say. As I say, we cannot afford to be silent. But we have to speak up for those who are least able to speak up for themselves, which is our little children. And if we do not, we will truly be failing them and we'll be failing the generations to come. Thank you, everybody. Uh, let's get organized again. Um, I still have all the WhatsApp groups from the past. So I look forward to, to fighting this fight with you for the sake of not just our children, but for literally the future of this country.